Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll, and welcome to 2020. Hope everyone's having a good new year so far. I'd like to start a tradition of starting off each calendar year with a bang, podcast-wise. Last year, to begin 2019, we had Sir Roger Penrose, one of the world's most famous scientists in the public sphere, but also someone who is enormously respected by his professional colleagues. So this year, 2020, we're going to start off with Daniel Dennett, who is a philosopher who is as well known as any philosopher is in the modern age among the general public, and also, once again, extraordinarily respected among his professional colleagues. I, in particular, have enormous respect for what Dan has done, and part of it is just that our attitudes are very similar, our approaches to what we do are very similar. If you know, It would not be completely wrong to say that when I am in a more philosophical mode, I'm trying to do for physics what Dan has been trying to do for biology and neuroscience and consciousness over the course of his career. As we'll talk about in the podcast, we, we go, it's a long podcast, it's a long episode, we cover an enormous amount of ground, so individual topics are breezed through very quickly, but there's a theme, there's a framework that ties it all together, which is this idea of taking what science teaches us about the world and connecting it to the world of our everyday experience. You know, for whatever science teaches us, it is very often going to be the case that even though it comes ultimately from our experience of the world, the ultimate theories that we end up building might seem very different, very surprising, even disconcerting. The Big Bang cosmology, quantum mechanics, Darwinian evolution are things that you wouldn't have just guessed just on the basis of your everyday experience without enormous amounts of observation and experimentation into realms that you don't see in your everyday life. And therefore, the theoretical frameworks you develop don't sound or feel much like our everyday world. This is especially noticeable when it comes to things like consciousness, free will, the nature of human beings. So what Dan Dennett has devoted his career to are taking discoveries from science, whether it's neuroscience or biology or what have you, computer science, artificial intelligence, and teasing out their philosophical implications. He is one of the world's leading philosophical naturalists, not a naturalist in the sense of going out into the forest and poking around the trees and the animals, but a naturalist in the sense of not being a supernaturalist, an ontology that says there is only the natural world. So how do you then explain things like purposes and meanings and other things that we human beings naturally associate? with our lives here in the world. That's what Dan has been trying to figure out for the course of his whole career. And so we have a wonderful discussion back and forth where we both ask each other questions because he's thought very, very deeply about the nature of existence, the world we live in, the nature of thought, how we conceptualize what's going on, and questions that are very important to me like emergence and intentionality, how it's okay to talk about things like purposes and choices in a world that is ultimately governed by the laws of physics. So I already said uh, previously, in I think maybe to, only to Patreon subscribers, but this is probably my favorite podcast interview that I've ever done, and I think that you're going to enjoy it just as much. Remember, we have a web page, preposterousuniverse.com slash podcast, where you can find show notes, transcripts of every episode, and you can also find a link to support Mindscape, if you like, on Patreon. And Patreon supporters get benefits like monthly Ask Me Anything episodes and episodes that are completely ad-free. So this is going to be a very, very fun episode. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's go. Dan Dennett, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Delighted to be with you. You had uh, a little thing that you said when I was in the room one time that I'm sure you've said many, many times, but it really struck a chord <laughs> with me. Uh, talking about Wilfred Sellers and the manifest image and the scientific image and how you thought of your task as a philosopher uh, to reconcile these. Why don't you tell us, why don't we begin setting the stage by telling us what these are? Oh, good. I'm glad you asked. Um, 
Wilfred Sellers, great American philosopher, uh, uh, said the ja job of philosophy was to explain how things in the broadest sense of the term hang together in the broadest sense of the term. Well, that sounds sort of trivial. <laughs> uh, how things hang together, well. But what he had in mind is this. There's all the things of the everyday world. Um, colors and sounds and haircuts and pains and, uh, and uh, dollars and home runs. Those are all things. And then in the scientific world, there's, there's uh, electrons and quarks and fields and uh, molecules. And uh, uh, how do we relate the things of our everyday sort of pre-scientific world to the things that science has discovered. And what a uh, hundred years and more have shown is there's no simple answer. Uh, <laughs> what, sorry, when did Sellers say this? Uh, uh, in 1961 okay. or two. So, But I mean, when I say a hundred years, I mean... Uh, let's say since Einstein, uh, that's when the world really starts to look weird from the scientific point of view. And you have people saying, really, it's all just atoms in the void and there's no such thing as solidity and uh, there's no such thing as colors. Uh, uh, and after all, atoms aren't colored. Mm -hmm. And the world's made of atoms. It's just <laughs> atoms in empty space. And we can go on from there. So uh, at one extreme, um, you have people who have insisted that the scientific image, that's the gold standard. That's what sets what's real. That's reality, yeah. That's reality. Everything else is illusion. Uh, but as uh, a, a cartoon I like puts it, um, uh, uh, reality may be, uh, uh, the world we live in may be an illusion, but it's the only place you can get a good cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's not very helpful to be told that not only do dollars and home runs not exist, but colors don't exist and pain doesn't exist. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, solidity doesn't exist. So we have to, we have to, um, negotiate between the two worlds. That's, Seller says, that's what philosophy is for. And I think, yeah, I agree. I, I, that's about as good a definition of philosophy as I can think of. But you're, you're adding a little bit, right? I mean, one could buy into Sellers' formulation while still denying that the, the uh, manifest image is capturing something real, right? Or, oh, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. Uh, Sellers' image leaves all the options open. Yeah. Um, it leaves open both the uh, hardcore scientific realist who d says everything else is just illusion. Uh, il eliminativism is philosophers mm -hmm. say. Or you could go to the other extreme and say the, uh, the, the electrons and quarks and all that, that's just a useful fiction. <laughs> What's really real is tables and chairs and people and ideas and love and so forth. And so those are the two extremes. And then there's all kinds of positions in the middle. And my view, which m might seem to be giving up, especially to philosophers, is to think uh, we have to l learn how to get back and forth between these two images, the manifest image and the scientific image. But the way we do that is not by strict definitions that are counterexample proof. The way we do it is with um, diplomatic and pedagogical ways of easing the passage. And we just, this, let me, I, an old example, voices. Are voices real? Okay. Yeah. What's a voice? What's it made of? Um, is it is it a is it a bodily part? Is it is it biological material? But you can record a voice. You can recognize a voice. It has causal power in the world. Somehow, it has right. Voices. If you say what category of thing they are, 
you you run out of it seems to be almost in a category by itself. Well, all right, fine. We we don't need a voice throat problem to go with a mind body problem. <laughs> <laughs> right, we can. Yeah. We 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 may not know how to answer the question of what voices are, but we're not mystified. We're not puzzled. We're not baffled. It's yeah. just a curious fact about the way language and and our perception of the world, our pre-scientific perception of the world, carves things up. And uh, and the otolaryngologists and the and the uh, other other biologists can and the acoustic engineers can tell us all about voices uh, without we don't ever have to settle that issue. Right. I labeled this view uh, in my book The Big Picture poetic naturalism. Being the motto being that there's only one world, the natural world, but there are many ways of talking about it. And those ways all can capture some elements of reality, and, and it's silly to call them illusions just because they're not the yeah. most fundamental thing. I think that's good. And yeah, I think, I think that, um, uh, see, I haven't read your book yet. So. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> uh, no, but I think that's, that's about... Yeah. That's about right. No, the idea was yeah. not supposed to be anything original. It's just a label, you know, to help yeah. people understand because there yeah. are there are people who want to who are limitivists, right? Who want to say that some of these higher level structures shouldn't count as real. Yeah, and and uh, I've been uh, uh, battling against that view for uh, uh, decades. So I'm sure we'll get there, but just to you know. Uh, label yeah. to put things on the table so before we get there yeah. so therefore you will think of things as such as consciousness and free will as real yeah for exactly this kind of reason yeah real but they're not what you think they are not what we think they are right okay yeah. i mean that's that's my motto x is real but it's not what you think it is <laughs> good so you you <laughs> wrote a paper a while ago called real patterns yeah and uh, I want to talk about that a little bit. I don't know if you even are aware that this has uh, become uh, an important, fun topic in quantum mechanics. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. No, David no. Wallace, who is one of the leading yeah, theorists yeah. of the Everett or Many Worlds interpretation, yeah, which yeah. I'm also a partisan of, uh, uh, leans on your paper and your notion of real patterns very heavily in his book, The Emergent Multiverse. Oh, great trying to explain how the classical world, you know, forget about tables and chairs, but even, you know, electrons with positions and atoms and things like that are somehow not there in the most fundamental formulation of quantum mechanics, but they describe a pattern and therefore they're real. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm delighted. Yes. <laughs> Can you give yeah. a, a, the sales pitch for what your view is there in that real patterns paper, what you're trying to get across? Um, the uh, main idea of the paper is that uh, if we think about information, we think about um, information theory, uh, we recognize that, uh, well, to put it in, in sort of everyday terms, <laughs> how big a file do you need to capture this particular phenomenon? Yeah. And um, um, it, if you have a, a, a checkerboard, uh, which has got just uh, 64 squares and some are black and some are white, pretty easy. You can give a very limited description of that pattern uh, and, and uh, uh, write it on the back of an envelope. If you've got um, a color picture of confetti and you have to describe it in detail, you've got a much bigger file. That's why, <laughs> that's why uh, some pictures on your phone are bigger have used more more megabytes than other pictures. It all depends on how much complexity there is in the picture. And if there's if there's no pattern in the picture at all, if it's just random, oddly enough, that that's one that takes the most information right. to record because you have to record every pixel. You can't say, well, there's a region of deep blue over here and there's a region of red over here. Those are nice. Uh, concise ways of taking advantage of the pattern in the phenomenon. So the idea of real patterns is take any phenomenon and are there patterns in it? Well, what's a pattern? A pattern is a, a summary, a concision, something that permits you to generalize so that you're better than a coin flip about what the next little bit of it is. If you've got any predictive edge at all on the data set that you're looking at, you got a pattern. 
Right. And it's not necessarily, uh, well, let me put it this way. We should be happily surprised when there are such patterns in some sense, right? I mean, if you, what, <laughs> what the patterns enable you to do is to ignore certain pieces of information, Absolutely. like you said. It, um, uh, nature uh, has designed, evolution, natural selection, has designed organisms to be ruthless pattern finders, to ignore almost all the information that's officially available at their surfaces and just focus in on what matters to them. Those are the patterns that if they can latch onto those, they can feed themselves and avoid getting eaten and live long, happy lives and mate and all the rest. So uh, the idea of a pattern is, uh, I think, a very... uh, useful and, and deep idea, and it can be given a, a nice, clear mathematical formulation, um, and it's the key. What, what science does is finds pattern, but it's also what the manifest image does. Right. It, um, um, we take for granted all the patterns that we see. In fact, we, we do more than that. We overinterpret them. Mm. That is... If we see two things that look the same shade of green to us, we think, well, deep, deep down, they're the same. No, they might be green for entirely different reasons. They might be so-called metamers, and they only look the same color to us because we're, you might say, green, green, colorblind. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to talk about The Great Courses Plus, a streaming service where you can learn from courses taught by The Great Courses, some of the best professors out there can teach you lectures on everything from science to business, history to personal development. There's something no matter what you want. One course I can recommend is Physics and Our Universe, How It All Works. Now, this sounds like something I could have taught myself. I did not. But it's a wonderful overview of all of physics all at once. So from subatomic particles, quarks and leptons, to stars, galaxies, and the entire universe itself. The course covers how our understanding of physics has changed over time and points towards what we're going to be learning in the future. So set a goal to learn more this year by signing up for The Great Courses Plus today. Mindscape listeners get an amazing deal, a full month of unlimited access for free. But to get that month, you must sign up using this special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash mindscape. That's T-H-E Great Courses Plus, P-L-U-S, dot com slash mindscape. Start learning today. I did a podcast with Melanie Mitchell, who's a computer scientist. Oh, yeah, I know her well. About um, the struggle of artificial intelligence to capture common sense, right? Yeah. And in, in, would it be off base to think that some of this struggle has to do with the fact that AIs, even very advanced deep learning networks and so forth, are not as good at finding the patterns as a human intelligence is at the current state of the art? Ah, good. Let's see. Um I think that's true, except for the fact that if you crank your deep learning system long enough, it'll find patterns where there aren't any patterns. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, deep learning uh, uh, systems, algorithms, are very good at squeezing pattern out of apparently random data. I mean, that's that's how the neuroscientists, they train up a... Uh, categorizer on on this fMRI data about what's going on in people's heads, and they discover they can make a prediction about what person's going to do ten seconds later. Yeah, <laughs> they can, uh, and that shows that it's a real pattern. Right. But a lot of the patterns they find by these methods aren't real. That is, they don't predict yeah. a thing. Well, that's the thing. I'm wondering if. Because what the AIs, what the deep learning networks are so good at is manipulating huge amounts of data that they they don't need to be as tricky as human beings are mm-hmm. to find the patterns that let you make yep. predictions yep. with fewer. That's right. So, of course, we pay a price for that. We're, it's not a miracle. And the price we pay for that is that we uh, have a lot of false positives. We see a lot more pattern in the world than is really there. Uh, we we see similarities that are 
um, uh, only similar in that they have the same effect on us, <laughs> uh, but not, they're otherwise as different as can be. Well, what does the does the word "real" in the phrase "real patterns" have the same meaning as the word "real" when we we're just talking about you know baseballs being real? Well, that was the idea. I mean, I wanted uh, to say. Uh, if we have the concept of a pattern, we do have some pretty good tests as whether it's real. That is, to put it bluntly, can you make money betting on it? Mm. If you can, it's predictive, it's real. Uh, and that's a touchstone of reality that seems to hold up very well. Uh, so let's say maybe patterns are the thing that's most obviously where we can make a, a real, non-real distinction. Right. And that everything, every other uh, uh, distinction between real and unreal, real and fictional, real and bogus, uh, is somehow dependent on that. So if someone, so if there's a room and there's, you know, this huge number of atoms in the room and of course, if, I, if you were infinitely smart and I gave you the location of all the <laughs> atoms and their velocities, you could predict anything. You could be Laplace's demon. But the patterns, the, there's, the other structures are the idea that I could give you much less information than that. I could mm -hmm. say exactly. there's a baseball and it's headed toward a window. Yeah. And then you could infer an enormous That's, amount from that. Exactly. And exactly. therefore, baseballs are real in some sense. That's right. right. Um, um, years ago, I concocted an example to show the power of this, uh, where we have a we have a visiting Martian who's a sort of Laplacian demon, and he's uh, in somebody's house, and the uh, and the phone rings, and the lady picks up the phone and says, um, uh, "Yes, dear, you're you're bringing the boss home for dinner. Do get a bottle of wine on your way home. See you in half an hour." And hangs up. Okay, so now uh, both the woman. And the Martian predicts that in, within 30 minutes, uh, two people are going to walk in the door, one of them holding a, a glass bottle filled with an alcoholic beverage. Uh, but the Laplacian demon has had to trace out the whole trajectory, <laughs> the stop signs yeah. and the lights and the paying for every the photon, wine and right. every photon. And to the Laplacian, this is a miraculous prediction. Where did she find, how did she do this without all that information? Well, very simple. She understood what was being yeah. said. Yeah. So let's take this point of view that patterns at the higher level that capture some, some influence, some predictability of the world, and, and apply it to the difficult cases, mm -hmm. right? Where mm -hmm. we have things like people and agents. And another uh, phrase that you popularized way back in the day is the intentional stance. No. So one of the sets of controversial concepts which we might ask, are, are these real or do they have some special status, are things like intentions, reasons why, aboutness, right? Like why mm -hmm, is a certain mm -hmm, painting about mm -hmm. something like that? So how do, how do those boundary contentious words fit into this picture? Oh, they fit in beautifully. And uh uh, the, um, the intentional stance patterns are just one particular set of patterns, and they're the set of patterns that have to do with living agents and non-living agents that living agents have made. I don't think there's any other non-living <laughs> agents. Um, and what's the simplest one? Well, when I first started writing about in the intentional stance, I chose a thermostat and said, you can consider the thermostat as a little agent that can be instructed to keep the temperature a certain way. It senses the temperature, and when the temperature falls below or a, uh, below the set mark, it, it, it has a desire to, to uh, uh, raise the temperature. Treat a thermostat as an agent surrogate. It, you, you could have a person standing there and sure. throwing logs on the fire. Um, but you can replace it with this dead simple thing. And you can explain it to a child, say, 
without going into the mechanics. And there, there are a hundred different ways you can In other words, you can explain it in terms of its purpose. Of its purpose. Rather in than its of, Exactly. Atoms. You say, consider it a little homunculus, a little, a little agent, and it has one desire only, and that is to maintain the temperature, but it has a way of sensing the temperature and responding to changes by making an appropriate uh, move. By the way, this is the way that one gets taught about transistors in physics class, oh, yeah. <laughs> as if there's a little man in there, a transistor man, who yeah, decides yeah, how much current yeah, to let yeah. through. <laughs> well, um, it turns out that this tactic, this strategy of adopting the intentional stance works throughout biology. It works not just for brains and for higher or organisms, it works for bacteria. It works for archaea. It works for uh, uh, single-celled organisms. Uh, the question is, does it work for things as it were smaller and simpler than that? Well, um, I like to say we're robots made of robots made of robots made of robots made of robots. And once you get down subcellular, you get down to the, the kinasins, the motor proteins, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and tubulin and things like that. And or <laughs> think of ribosomes, fantastic little machines. Um, you can treat them from the intentional stance. Um, they have a job to do. They have, they have a job to do. They know how to do it. And uh, one of the things that I particularly like about motor proteins is that it now turns out basically they're sailing. They're using the storm of the water molecules right. inside the sail, and they have sort of ratchets in their feet. So they're actually selectively using the energy in the random uh, bombardment of the water molecules as a, as a source of power. And it reminds me of Ricky Skaggs' great line, I can't control the wind, but I can trim the sails. <laughs> and wow. that's your basic agent. And it's just a protein. Right, right. It's a little Maxwell demon. I mean, it this is. is a, it this is. is, in the last just 15 or 20 years, this has become another hot topic in physics, understanding these non-equilibrium fluctuations yeah, yeah. in very, very tiny yeah. things. And I, I think that it's probably still underappreciated in, in my personal world how much this uh, transition from the world of individual particles where it would make no sense to adopt the intentional right, right. stance to the, to the macroscopic world is driven by entropy in the arrow of time. Yeah. I think it's yeah. actually... I think... Um, uh, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think the key element to being an agent is having a history, mm. a history that makes a difference. That is, something can happen to it that changes it, and that changes it again. It has a sort of memory. Yeah, I think and that's... just <laughs> interesting thing about electrons, they don't pick up scars or dirt or anything. You, uh, you can't, an electron, over, over a billion years doesn't change at all. And that's a huge difference. Now, I had a, we had a wonderful argument in Santa Fe at the Santa Fe Institute with David Wolpert and his colleagues. And one of our big issues was whether tornadoes hmm. count as agents. <laughs> and I'm trying to predict which side are you on. I'm not, like, I can't do it. Um, I was against it. Yeah, OK. Um, um, because I didn't think that the tornado could actually exploit information right. uh, as, you know, the way a thermostat. Can. It's a complex system, but it, it, uh, ascribing yeah, yeah. agency or intention to it doesn't yeah. seem to help. Much. So that was, but, but it was a very illuminating discussion. So either, if, if you want to look at the boundaries you want to look at things like tornadoes, or, yeah, yeah, uh, um, or uh, motor proteins, right? Uh, and but in the biologic, in the living world, everything bigger than a motor protein is is 
a designed thing and it has purposes. It's got parts that have jobs to do. Yeah, I think participating in the arrow of time is probably a necessary precondition for mm -hmm. uh, being an agent in this sense. You know, yeah, yeah. the thing about an electron is, like you said, they don't have scars. Yeah. Uh, they don't change over time, really. But more complicated things have different access to the past versus the future. They have mm -hmm. memories of the past, and mm -hmm. they can a little bit. All they can do is predict the future, mm -hmm. and that's when it becomes. That's when purposes and things like that yeah. might become necessary. Yeah. So uh, I, I presume what you're going to say then is um, ascribing intentionality or purposes to things uh, has a reason why we, there's a reason why we do that, a reason we have reasons. It makes sense for ribosomes. So it makes sense in exactly the same way for human beings, yeah. not in a different way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, uh I think it's interesting to think about the history of this. Um, before there was language, you didn't have any agents that were comparing notes, that were arguing, that were explaining. Hmm. Language brought into the world, into, onto our earth, something that Wilfred Sellers called the space of reasons. And this is the, the space of reasons is where human persuasion and explanation and querying and challenging happens. Mm -hmm. The whys um, uh, and the becauses. Uh, and the arrival, the emergence of the space of reasons, that has to have an evolutionary history too. Uh, and there's only in one species. Uh, so that's why I'm interested so much in the evolution of language and in evolution of human minds, which are profoundly different from even chimpanzee minds or dolphin minds or whale minds. Take your favorite birds. Uh, take your favorite species. Human minds are really different. And they're different precisely because they are obliged to articulate reasons. Hmm. Okay. And they learn how to do this, and it's an imperfect business, and some are better than others. But it's the fundamental basis for morality. If you are responsible, it's because you respond to reason. You you can you can't argue a bear out of what it's doing, but you can. Right. You know, a human being is supposed to be persuadable. So you can train or teach a dolphin or a dog or whatever, but you don't give it a reason why. It's just right. it's pure right. stimulus and response, right? right. right? And and. Uh, Recently in my work, I've had lots of examples of what I call free-floating rationales. This is where we see a phenomenon, the reasons are clear, but they're not the reasons of the organisms involved. So the, the starting or pronking gazelles that are throwing these great uh, extravagant leaps and they're running away from the lions say, what are they doing? And it's a tremendous waste of energy and it makes it dangerous. <laughs> what they're doing is they're showing off. They are uh, signaling to the lions, don't bother trying to catch me. I can throw these big, mm. expensive, dangerous leaps and still outrun you. Go after my cousin over there. He can't do it. <laughs> and the lions believe them. Huh. And the evidence for this is, is pretty clear. I was going to ask, you know... Th th there this is a is a danger testable, that there's, there's a, a there's, just-so this story, is a but this is a testable hypothesis. This is a testable and tested hypothesis. Yes. And, and uh, sure enough, uh, uh, the, the lions discriminate, uh, and they don't go for the ones that are stunting. Now, I've given you the rational explanation. The lions are, in effect, wise to take this information that's being offered to them. It benefits both the, the speedy gazelle and the lion. It doesn't have to work as hard to get his supper. Um, and there's lots and lots of cases of this. But don't think that the lion understands this or that the mm -hmm. gazelle understands this. This is a, a rationale that has been uncovered by natural selection. The gazelle 
just doesn't know why it wants to make those leaps. It does if it can. The lion doesn't know why it doesn't care for those jumpy ones. Um, it, they don't have to know. So they are the beneficiaries of a rational system, but they don't have to understand it. And that's more or less exactly the same sense in which AlphaGo doesn't know why it puts a certain token on the that's Go right. board in some that's way. That's right. It knows what to do. Yeah. It couldn't yeah. tell you why. And, 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 and so does... So do the ribosomes in every one of your cells. There's a rationale for every part of the job. I mean, if you look at the machinery, elegant, elegant engineering, but the ribosome doesn't know. <laughs> and in fact, no agent figured that out in advance. The Nobel winning molecular biologists, the chemists, yeah. they worked it out for the first time what the rationale is, but the rationale is secure as anything. And in some sense, because you know we're all among philosophers here, um, the fact that we human beings can attach reasons to this in this sense has to do with some sort of counterfactual thought experiment. If the gazelles were not leaping in that way, yeah, yeah. then we know that the lions yeah. would chase them, yeah. even if the gazelles right. don't know that. Right. No, it's... Um, the intentional stance, uh, it's it's like an instinct. I think I think we're we're, uh, and I think probably though it's it's a, a Baldwin effect. I think that first first it came on the scene, uh, at his, in its articulate form, uh, with human beings discovering they could they could sh talk about the reasons why things were happening. Um, but we're very, very good at it. And uh, in fact, if you want to see it as an instinct, you can go back and see the um, early animations of simple triangles and, and circles moving around on the screen. But everybody looks at it and says, oh, the big circle is trying <laughs> to catch the little circle. Everybody right. instantly sees intentionality and purpose in these cases. Infants, quite young infants, uh, are puzzled by violations of the apparent agency in very, very simple displays. But in the circles and triangles, isn't that kind of an edge case here? Because we're saying that um, the, the ascribing of intentions to human beings or to the behavior of the gazelles is real and true, whereas presumably mm. it's not real and true in the case of well, the circles and triangles. Well, hang on. <laughs> um, um, let's see, whose experiments uh, am I thinking of? I can't think of his name right now, German psychologist. Um, when, he, when he made the films to show to people, as a, he deliberately set out to create these intentional patterns. I see. Okay. Um, he so there so, was an intention so working the, behind the scenes. Uh, there was. A, he wanted to create. He wanted to show that just by, um, and in fact, he tested this by having sort of randomly moving circles uh, uh, and triangles, and people did not attribute intentionality to those. That was just noise. <laughs> so so uh, so so there was. And in the same way, natural selection has enforced the patterns that we see in the jumping gazelles and the lions. It's not just random. Right. So uh, we, we can see intention where there's none. We're, we're very good at that. It's called paranoia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Finchin has some novels about this. Yes, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, so you can see it emerging, I guess. Uh, yeah. You don't use the word emergence that much, but are you happy with the word? Uh, emergence is a, is a word that I don't use much because it has a, a, a sordid history yeah. in philosophy where emergence comes to mean... Woo, woo, yeah. inexplicable. <laughs> right. And uh, so... Physicists use it all the time, but I, I'm warned if, by my philosophy colleagues. If, if um, 
Yeah, in fact, I, uh, uh, when John Holland wrote his book, Emergence, I said, John, John, <laughs> you've got to put a forward in where you say what you don't mean. Uh, and, I mean, that, I completely approve of John Holland's work on Emergence. Right, okay. Uh, because it does not mean that this is a, a, an inexplicable pattern precisely not in fact I like to illustrate emergence with uh, John Horton Conway's life world mm -hmm. and the amazing patterns that emerge there and say look that's emergence and that's completely explainable and predictable there's, yeah. there's, there's no question mark anywhere in that system uh, but it creates stunning emergent effects yeah, and you could you can talk this higher level vocabulary and Absolutely. capture some of that's the real. It. Yeah, you, that's, that's right. it. That's what emergence gets you. I want to pause for a moment to talk about Policy Genius, a wonderful tool that helps you decide what kind of insurance to get, whether it's life insurance, home insurance, auto insurance, etc. You know, we just started 2020. We're going to look forward to a whole bunch of jokes forthcoming about 2020 hindsight. Because, of course, it's easier to explain what did happen than to correctly predict what's going to happen. That's what good insurance is all about. It's helping ameliorate the fact that you can't predict exactly what's going to happen. What you can try to do is buy the right kind of insurance. And so Policy Genius makes this a breeze. In minutes, you can compare quotes from a large number of top insurance companies to find your best price. You could save $1,500 or more a year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. And then once you apply, Policy Genius will handle all the paperwork and red tape. They take the angst out of finding the right insurance policy. So even though predicting the future is very hard, don't get discouraged. Get life insurance. It takes just a few minutes to find your best price by applying at policygenius.com. Policy Genius, it's better to get the future right. With that definition of emergence on the table, I mean, it seems to make sense that patterns are real. If we're going to you know, yeah. as ascribe reality to these higher level things that give us some way of capturing what's going on. Um, purposes and intentions are in that bucket like they, yes. they serve a purpose like say yeah, that absolutely. is a reason why that helps us understand what's going on absolutely so now we get to consciousness right yes <laughs> yeah uh, maybe they'll just let you uh fit yeah. it in and and it emerges in this innocent sense uh and the idea that it's one thing that everything in the universe is either conscious or not, that it's the light is on or the light is off. That is, I think, a fundamental error. Mm. Um, but it's very widespread. Uh, it's just amazing how many really deep and clever thinkers can't get it out of their heads that consciousness is all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think, no, no, it's emergent. And in fact, what that means is that the uh, search for the simplest form of consciousness, uh, uh, that's a snipe hunt. It's a wild <laughs> goose chase um, because it emerges. And, and yes, starfish are, have some of the aspects of consciousness, so do trees uh, and bacteria. Uh, and as you... But not electrons. But not electrons. And, you know, we can argue about uh, motor proteins, yeah. I guess. Right. But, but, uh, but once you but, admit that it's nothing mystical, it's something that yeah, builds right. up, and, then you can and, argue. And the question, where do you draw the line, is, a, is an ill-motivated question. That's like, where do you draw the line between night and day? Do you have a simple definition of what consciousness is that you prefer? Um, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's. Um, you did uh, write a book called Consciousness Explained. So, I, I, mean, I did. This might and, be and, an okay question. And, and I. Uh, uh, but I think that that's, for, in one regard, that's, that's the way science proceeds, too. Uh, the, uh, scientists don't 
um, sit around uh, wasting hours and hours and hours trying to define time yeah. and energy. They, they get on with the theory. And once they've got a really good theory, it'll be obvious what time or energy is. And I think that's the same with consciousness. Okay, um, but still you but, must have uh, something in mind, yeah. But, yeah, I think that... Um, let's talk about human consciousness. Of course. Um, human consciousness is much more in my uh, view, and it's, a, it's an embattled one, but I'm uh, pretty sure of it. Human consciousness is much different from the consciousness of any other species. And the reason it's hard to see this is, well, there's many reasons. One is that consciousness has a, a, a moral dimension, and we want to be kind to animals. And, and, and the very idea, some would say, well, yes, dogs are conscious, but not the way we are. And p people immediately, they get their backs up and they he's about ready to talk about mistreating animals and it not matter. No, 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 no. Uh, because I think m the properties of human consciousness that we share with dogs and uh, mammals and birds uh, to some degree with reptiles and fish, uh, those have moral significance. So let's see if we can take moral significance as itself a graded notion. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's interesting. British law, octopus vulgaris, protected. It's an honorary vertebrate. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, it's against the law, you know, to throw a, a live octopus on a hot grill. When did this become against the law in the UK? There, oh, sometime in the last 20, 30 okay. years. I had not heard that. But it's, it's just, it's just, it's that one, it's not all cephalopods. It probably should be. Squid. You want to you you want to throw a squid on a live grill? You can, <laughs> but the but, point is you, that you are allowed to boil a lobster, but you, you are allowed. Yeah, you can't uh, do the, it for uh, the. The British parts. law says v vertebrates. Yeah, is a is a cutoff. Right. Okay. And uh, so, I think cutoffs can, are okay in general for these tricky questions, right? I mean, people say, well, if you draw the line here, then. They they yeah. argue about either side, yeah, but yeah. you, you got to draw it somewhere. Well, sometimes especially for legal well, the purposes. law the law has to draw lines. Yeah, exactly. And what we should recognize is the law draws lines that are uh, reasonable to to the vast majority of people, and we can we can talk about exceptions. Uh, it, this is an interesting case. Yeah. The, the the wonderfulness of octopus. The, the amount of convergent evolution between octopus and, say, human beings is enough to sort of push them, push <laughs> right. them over the line. And I think, you know, I, I approve. I, I say, yes, indeed. Um, uh, so, but if we put the moral issue behind us, well, no, before we put the moral issue behind us, we should note that... Almost nobody wants to hold any non-human species responsible, morally responsible for their behavior. That's key. Yeah. They may be, as one says, moral patients, but they're not moral agents. A bear that kills a tourist is not committed murder. Just not. Yep. Because they don't have the mental wherewithal they don't have the kind of free will that we have. We couldn't have offered them a reason not to do that. That's right. We, we can't expect them to appreciate the societal norms that we've set up and so forth. So, uh, even, so don't look in a bear's brain and a human brain for the fact that one of them is indeterministic and the other one is deterministic determinism has nothing to do with the issue yeah. it has to do with information it has to do with self-control and with degrees of freedom and the and uh 
Degrees of freedom is a term that I've been using more and more recently, uh, and really ha seeing it come more out of engineering than, than out of physics and thinking, a degree of freedom is an opportunity for control. And you can clamp a degree of freedom, and then you don't have to control it. You can just lock it down uh, in one way or another. Yeah. How many degrees of freedom do we have? <laughs> millions, millions, because we can think about so many things. We have orders of magnitude more degrees of freedom than a bear does. That means the problem of, with roughly the same number of cells and so yeah. forth, right? But our yeah, complexity yeah, is yeah, much higher. Yeah. It means that the options that the bear has are a vanishing subset of the options that we have. And learning to control our perusal of those options, that's not a science, it's an art. And it's what we try to train our kids to grow up so that when we launch them and they are no longer in our control, that they will be able to control themselves in ways that will lead them to have happy and productive lives. And if they can't, they're going to get in trouble. And we have to have that set of troubles looming out there for those who can't control themselves. Well, you've used the word agent a few times, and I use it all the time, but we haven't described what that word means. I mean, it's clearly a relationship between agency, responsibility, consciousness. <clears throat> yeah. Is there a simple definition of agent, if not of consciousness? Well, well, again, the thing is that agents come in all sizes and shapes, too. And uh, a few minutes ago, we were talking about bacteria as agents and viruses as agents, heavens. Mm. Uh, uh, so uh, that's not the sense of agent. We want something, uh, we want a moral agent. We want to talk about a moral agent is not just a, a, a locus of self-control with, with purposes and, a, and an ability to fend for itself and prolong its existence and improve its, enhance its uh, uh, circumstances. That's a pretty good definition of an agent. Something that can fend off the second law of thermodynamics, fend off dissolution. Uh, uh, that would other, you know, mountains aren't agents because erosion just yeah. They they can't protect themselves or move or anything. But you can see why tornadoes are an interesting edge case. <laughs> exactly. That's why, that's why tornadoes are an edge case. Um, but at the m most sophisticated, if we climb that ladder, and I think a pretty good scale would be um, how, many, how many degrees of freedom are available for control? And when it gets up into the billions, as it does for even young children, mm -hmm. uh, now we're talking about potential moral agents. And a moral agent is simply a human being at the moment. We don't have any other. Uh, we could, but we don't. A human being that is mature enough and it has nothing to do with how old they are, except coincidentally, mature enough to control the degrees of freedom that matter when they matter and to be able to foresee and understand the outcomes of possible actions and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that gives us a pretty good, uh, I call it a, a member of the moral agents club. Right. Good. I think that that does make sense to me, uh, but but it deviated us from our task, which was you were explaining the salient features of human consciousness. That's right. Yeah. Um, so one of the um, 
curious features of the way the science has proceeded here is that many theories of consciousness only attempt half a theory. We, and they, this is the inbound path or the upward path. And we get, we get from the photon striking the retina and the sound waves and up and up through the nervous system, and up through the various cortical areas, and then ta-da, consciousness happens. That's the end of the theory. <laughs> um, wait a minute. I want to ask my, what I call the hard question, and then what happens? I mean, what makes whatever you say amounts to consciousness? In the way? What makes that consciousness? What does it enable? What does becoming conscious of this or that enable the agent whose consciousness it is to do? Or disable that agent from doing? What effects does it have on those multiple degrees of freedom? And the answer is, Almost anything can happen. <laughs> but we need to have the neuroscientific theory of how that can be true and how the various sequelae, the various outcomes can spell themselves out. I mean, it's some people's theories of consciousness are a little bit like somebody who mounts a, a closed-circuit TV camera on the uh, hood of his car and, and, and puts a receiver under the hood so the end car can see where it's going. I mean, no. You, what, what, what's going to consume that information? You, it's, uh, Ruth Milliken talks about the consumers of representations. And... In theories, scientific theories of consciousness, there has been a, a, a systematic neglect of the consumers. Hmm. Uh, Sorry, the consumers are... The consumers are <laughs> ultimately neural structures that respond to representations spread all over the brain in ways that give rise yeah. to the ability of people to report and reflect on and remember. It, there's a tremendous difference between uh, sensing something and noticing that you're sensing something mm. and noticing that you're noticing that you're sensing something. The first time I ever was familiar with your work was the collection you edited with Douglas Hofstadter called yeah. The Mind's Eye. And... I'm not sure that at that young age when I came across it, I absorbed very much. But the one idea that kept coming through was this recursive self-awareness idea. Absolutely. We're looking at yeah. ourselves, and that has yeah. something to do with what it means yeah. to be conscious. Yeah, yeah. the recurs recursion. And, and, and Doug is the maestro there. Exactly. Um, his book, I Am a Strange Loop, is a is a is really a retelling of the what he did in his earlier work in Gertel Escherbach. And... Uh, Amazing thing about Gertel Escherbach is that it was a bestseller to a surprise, <laughs> and a lot of people read it, but a lot of people didn't understand it. No, and so he. I read the dialogues when I was a kid. It yeah, took me a long yeah, time to catch up but, and read the but, rest um, of it. Uh, so I am a strange loop. Is in a way, um, Doug's uh, attempt to do what Hume did. Hume wrote uh, the treatise on human nature, which he said fell deadborn from the press, and then he had to write the inquiry. So that people would understand yep. what he was saying in the <laughs> treatise. And Doug had to write, I'm a strange loop. So absolutely right. Recursion. It's this capacity for indefinite reflection and reflection on reflection. Because whenever you can reflect in this way, in effect, you create a new object to think about. Uh, we... Let's let's take a um, let's take a frog. A frog has a fairly complicated life, and it's faced at every moment 
with a number of opportunities. And it survives if it makes good decisions at those opportunities. Those are degrees of freedom, and it controls them as best it can. Frogs are agents. They fend for themselves. Yeah. But they don't know they have opportunities. There's no, there's no sign that they can think about their opportunities as opportunities. The reason this, I think, quite obvious fact is hidden from us is what I sometimes call the Beatrix Potter syndrome. Whenever we see a clever animal or an animal doing something that is appropriate and reasonable, sly, we are, find it almost irresistible to attribute to the mm -hmm. animal the understanding that we have of what it's doing. And the fact is that very often it's, it's clueless. It's the beneficiary of a very good system. It doesn't have to understand yeah. it. <laughs> and, it's, and that's even true of a lot of human behavior. Uh, uh, one of my favorite examples is um, Grice's theory of meaning. Um, now, according to Paul Grice, the late, great Paul Grice, when you and I converse, when an utterer, I, make, give you a, a speech act, I, when I utter a speech act, I intend you to form a belief based on my speech act. But I also intend you to recognize that I have that intention. So we get third order. I intend you to believe right. that I am <laughs> the intentionality on both sides. You, is we've got key. You, you've got you've got uh, reflexivity, uh, right. uh, and Grice's theory. There was something clearly wonderful about this theory, but as a theory of human everyday psychology, it's it's nuts. <laughs> um, kids have deep and wonderful conversations <laughs> with their parents and their peers long before they have the capacity to reflect in this way. Um, what you have to understand is that Grice wasn't lying. He was uncovering the free-floating rationales of human communication. He was doing the same thing that the that the ethologists are doing when they figure out what this starting is all about. Yeah. They, he's finding the rationales. This is why communication has the forms it does. This is why it works, and these are the conditions. And various individuals can be more or less virtuosic in their sensitivity to this. Um, you wouldn't want to be constantly thinking about recognizing the intentions of yeah. this person you're speaking to. Because <laughs> if you did, you couldn't pay attention to what they were saying. This <laughs> idea of the frog not worrying too much about its decision-making uh, is fascinating. I, I did a podcast with Malcolm McIver, who is a neuroscientist and mechanical engineer at Northwestern. And he is, is trying to explore the idea that one of the major transitions that led to consciousness was when fish climbed up on land. Hmm. The idea being that a fish swimming around at a few meters per second is underwater and can only see a few meters in front of it. All of its evolutionary pressures are to make decisions very rapidly. Once you climb up on land and you can see for kilometers, there's a new space of possibilities that opens up, namely imagine different possible things to do and contemplate which one would be best. And so he says that uh, climbing up onto land enabled the evolution of imagination, which was a mm -hmm. crucial step along the road to consciousness. Oh, that's nice. Um, uh, I'm not sure I, I believe it, but, but it's a nice variation on a theme that I'm very fond of. Which uh, um, uh, and that's um, Andrew Parker's idea about the uh, Cambrian explosion, uh, and that he, uh, Parker hypothesizes that 
the shallow ocean became transparent in a way it hadn't been before. Mm. And this suddenly permitted distal perception. It permitted eyesight. And that the book is called In the Blink of an Eye. And he argues that uh, the arms race of predator and prey, locomotion, c camouflage, armor, this all was generated by a growing transparency. And uh, it's not the only theory out there, sure. but it's one that I think there's got to be an element of truth in it. And I've been arguing that what we're facing right now is the second great transparency, and that's the electronic transparency. And everybody's now worried, and so they should be, about privacy and yeah. uh, we can... We can, we can now see farther and we can see into things we could never see into before, but we can also be watched. Yeah, and our can sensory be capacities, for better or for worse. And so we're greater. now all, <laughs> to invert the image, we're all now living in a fishbowl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but wait a minute. I wanted, you, you used a phrase that was, you did not use the phrase the hard problem, but you used the phrase the hard question. question. Good, but there was, there's at least a family resemblance between the distinction you're drawing between this sort of bottom up <coughs> theories of consciousness and top down yep. and Chalmers' distinction between the yep. easy problem and the hard problem. Yeah, and, and I, it, it's not coincidental. <laughs> um, uh, so I asked the hard question before David raised the hard problem, oh, okay. which I've been throwing pails of cold water on for mm -hmm. decades now. And I think that uh, the hard problem, uh, Chalmers' problem, is precisely the fix you get yourself into if you stop and don't try to answer the hard question. If you don't ask the hard questions, uh, then what happens? Then you're left with this gobsmacking, jaw-dropping, uh, mind-deadening mystery. For the audience, just just very briefly, let's tell them what the hard question is that you have and the hard problem yeah, that Chalmers yeah. likes to emphasize. Um, uh, David introduces the hard problem by co contrasting it with the easy problems. The easy problems is, how, how does your brain um, discriminate things? How does it move your your tongue in language, how does, how, how does it do all the cognition that you engage in? How does it uh, recognize things and have memory and all the rest? Those are the easy problems. So what's the hard problem? He, he by the way, recognizes they're not actually easy. It's they're not, they're not, yes, he does. <laughs> but but uh, the, the hard problem is the problem of why is it like anything at all to be mean? What, and, and, What's red? What's my experience of red or pain? What's, and these are so-called qualia. Right. And uh, philosoph it's a philosopher's term. comes from the Latin. It just means quality, property, really. <laughs> but qualia are a term of art in philosophy, and I think it's a bad one. It's, a, it, it's an artifact of bad theorizing, which has led to you know, hundreds of careers of misguided thinking about mind and consciousness. And alas, a lot of scientists have been uh, seduced by it so that they think that philosophers have this idea of qualia and qualia, that's where the, that's where the going really gets tough. It's explaining qualia those That's subjective the hard problem, properties. Right? That's the hard problem. How do we explain qualia? And uh, Chalmers has been arguing for this for decades, and recently he's written a paper on the meta problem. <laughs> and the meta problem is why do we have a hard problem? <laughs> and to which part of my response is what do you mean we? <laughs> Um, dogs don't have a hard problem. That doesn't mean they're not conscious. It means they're not reflexively, ruminatively, theoretically conscious of their consciousness. That's only for us. And that's the, the hard problem arises as an artifact of the fact that we're reflective. 
And in our reflections, we focus on what is otherwise a stunning embarrassment. When we look inside to see what's going on, mainly we can't tell. Now, you mean by um... well, well, let's think about think about seeing for a moment. Yeah, uh, I, I I look out the window and I see I see a birdhouse on a stake between two trees. How do I know I see it? Well, you know, if I close my eyes, I can't see it anymore. Goes away. All right, so I now know light has to bounce off and uh, you know the photons have to come into my eye and blah 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 retina ganglion cells uh, uh, lateral geniculate nucleus so forth but that's nothing to which i have direct access that's something i had to learn from books that's third person knowledge of the process my first person knowledge is very limited i tell you there's a birdhouse out there how do you know i can see it what do you mean well, my eyes are open, and there it is. Well, how do you know that you're seeing a birdhouse? Well, because it looks like a birdhouse. <laughs> but how do you know it looks like a birdhouse? What's going on inside? I don't know. It just looks like a bird. I can describe it in more detail if you want. Now, nobody is freaked out, apparently, by the fact that neuroscientists can come in and figure out all these amazing details about what happens between the eyeball and the lips, let's say, but mainly between the eyeball and your experience. Well, notice that that's only half the story. The other half of the story is, and what happens between experience and your ability to talk about it? and answer all these questions. Well, it's just as much neuroscience that has to go into that as it has to go into the first part. Now, if you stop with experience, then you simply, it's like declaring victory halfway through the battle. No, you've got the whole rest of a theory. You don't have a theory of consciousness until you've explained what happens next? I, I like to point out that if you have a theory of consciousness that still has a witness in it, mm. you've only got half a theory. So you want to turn experience into something going on in the brain, in the neurons, and that would be a necessary and part the, of And the all theory. the reactions to the experience. Yeah. A, a, a good theory of consciousness, when, you, when we finally have one, it will be like Leibniz's mill. We'll walk around and be like a deserted factory. There's <laughs> nobody home. There's no agents. It's all just machinery. That a theory of consciousness simply has to have that form. And people who resist that, like Chalmers, they've got a hard problem. In fact, they've got a systematically impossible, impossible problem. problem. Right. And... I at least am saying, I'll show you how to get out of the hard problem, namely by asking and then answering the hard question. And then what happens? And my way of doing that now, I've hit on this with the philosopher Keith Frankish. Um, have you ever piloted a drone a little, mm -hmm. you know, so you've had the remote unit in your hands and you're making the drone go where it's going. You're looking at the little screen and, and using the joysticks and all that. All right, think of that. That remote controller for the drone, that's the Cartesian theater outside. It's a control room for the drone. So now, suppose we were to emancipate a drone. In other words, all the control decisions that you doing while you're piloting the drone, we're going to upload those Put them on board the drone. It's already got a lot of yeah. of of self control already on board. But we want to we want to get every last bit of decision making and discrimination and noticing and so forth and control. We want to move it all into the drone. To do that, we'll be asking and answering the hard question. 
because notice, by the way, the first thing you do once you start doing that is you throw away the screen. <laughs> Who needs the screen, right? You don't need the screen. You've already got all the spatial information in just the form you want it for uploading. Namely, you've got it into into bit strings that are that can be computed. You've got you've got just the medium you need. Now that may not be the brain's medium, but at least you've got it into the medium that you're going to have to get it into for controlling the drone in various ways. And in our thought experiment, a very extended thought experiment, unpublished, we're just working on it. We gradually see, we point out the importance of, uh, instead of just rewiring it when it comes back from each mission or reprogramming it, we want to be able to um, inform it, suggest it, mm. things to it, talk with it. We want it, to, we want it to be in the space of reasons. Give it reasons, yeah. And so we want to install language, but we don't want to install language the old-fashioned, good old-fashioned AI way by you know, designing it and simply putting it in. We want it to learn in negotiation with us. Hmm. We want it to uh, be able to have its own way of making points. <laughs> and as we think about the task of helping a drone create a language that it can use to communicate with us, and we'd like it to be as close say, to English as we can get it, and to teach the drone English. But we want to teach, we want the drone to learn English, not just be wired up for English at birth. Uh, this will give us models of answers to all the hard questions. And it might not be the correct answer for our brains. It might not be, but at least, but at an least, answer. exactly. Yeah. And I think that's the way AI has always been. Um, it gives you an existence proof. <laughs> this may not be the way we do it, but it's a way of doing this job. And the idea that it's uh, magic. Uh, or you know beyond human can we know it's not beyond human can because we found a way of doing it right so um it's very hard to even ask the hard questions first of all we have no personal private knowledge about how we do it. Um, suppose I ask you to um, hmm. imagine three cows standing in the field and the one on the left is brown and the other two are mottled. You can do it. I do it, yep. Yeah. How? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You you, you heard my request and you were able to act on it. Yeah. Now, an interesting thing about just a simple case like that, another example. I want you to imagine putting a plastic bucket over your head and climbing hand over hand up a rope. Okay. Okay. Now, I deliberately chose items that would not be alien to, say, a chimpanzee in a zoo. Can the chimpanzee stimulate its own brain? Can it, could it, it we can't ask it. Yeah. Can it ask itself? Can it, does it have the, the layer of control over its own cognitive processes so that as it sat there not otherwise occupied, it could manipulate those familiar items of its experience. Good question. I don't know the don't answer, know. Yeah. but I suspect the answer is no. And I suspect the answer is no because you, you can't do that wordlessly until you can do it 
interactively with language. Without language, I don't think you have the, the, the systems in your cognitive system for self-stimulation, for self-probing that we have. We are, in, we are virtuoso self-probers of our own brain. It's interesting. I, I, I want to pause just to say we've been going on for a little over an hour now. I'm very happy to keep going. I have a lot to ask about, but I don't want to impose on you too much. I'm happy. I've still got some water. Cool. All right. I'm good. having a great time. Good. Excellent. Um, mm-hmm. It's very interesting you say exactly that because I once asked Stephen Pinker, uh, what is the role that language plays in consciousness? And he says, none whatsoever. Mm. <laughs> he said it's a completely different thing. Yeah. Uh, yes, I know. I know Steve's view well. And uh, I think Steve is tremendously smart uh, much smarter than some of his critics take him to be, uh, but I think he's wrong about this. Got it. Okay, I didn't. I didn't know uh, no, whether no, like all the experts had a no, point no, of no, view or no, no. No, I'm I'm pretty much out on a limb here, um, in claiming it as I did in consciousness explained that that human language doesn't just let us talk about what we're conscious of. Human language allows us to be conscious of things that we otherwise wouldn't be conscious of, uh, uh, things that bears and dogs and fish and birds are not conscious of the way we are. Right. And I think once you (coughs) appreciate, or, or if you appreciate, if you believe that recursion and self-representation yes. and things like that are crucial, then obviously language is a hugely useful tool. For Indeed. I, I think that language is... Um, here, this is a, a, a strange inversion of, say, Chomsky's view. Chomsky has the, I think, bizarre view that recursion uh, is a sort of Shazam gift of natural selection, this giant leap that once you have recursion, then everything else falls into place, and it, it is the the basis for 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 language. Um, and there's a sense in which I think he's almost right, but I think it's the other way around. I think it's language that mm, doesn't make any heavy use of recursion in its controls. Gradually creates in us the capacity to create recursive levels in our own brains. And it goes back to the thing I was giving you some examples of a a few minutes ago. Like, uh, I can ask you, okay, now I want you to imagine a blue triangle. And you can do that. And not perfectly, but... um, uh, Daniel Dorr has a book called The Instruction of Imagination, which is a wonderfully un and look at language. <laughs> and I think he's got a lot of this right. Um, what language permits is the development of, of a sort of a a place to stand, you know, Archimedes and his, mm-hmm. give me a place to stand and I'll move the world with a lever. Um, language gives us places to stand in our own cognition, which permit us then to um, self-stimulate, to probe, to explore our own brains. And that's what creates recursion. And that's what creates the creatures of recursion which are things like qualia. Right. right. Uh, uh, it creates a whole uh, menagerie of properties that are not real properties. They are properties that are the um, effects. <laughs> well, that, no, I, it's hard to say this. They are subjective in the sense that the appreciation of the property is what uh, brings it into existence. I see. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Now, I think I probably agree with you too much about all, all these issues, but let me, for purposes of podcast conversation, try to channel the, the skeptics. Um, you know, they place a huge amount of emphasis on the distinction between a sort of an external third person view and the internal first person mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. Chalmers goes so far as to imagine the possibility of a P zombie that could act exactly like you do, but have no inner conscious mm -hmm. experience. It always seems like a bit of a uh, conversation stopper to me, that idea that you need to speak the language of first person subjective experience even to have this conversation because uh, we're all different. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it, yeah if, this is um, uh, on the one hand, I think the idea of a philosophical zombie is just an embarrassment. <laughs> um, somebody, one philosopher once said to me, Dan, if I understand you right, if I want to talk about philosophical zombies, I should probably put a paper bag over my head. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think that they're um, not possible is that, or not conceivable. That's right. I right? Think, they're incoherent. I think, that, I think that there's a way of, I think, really showing that, that this is, whatever it was trying to do, it doesn't do a real job. And it and it it creates just a distracting monster that should be ignored. But then let's look at the job it was trying to do. And you had a pretty good version of it just now when you said it looks as if we need we can't just stay with the third person point of view. We need the first person point of view. And so let's let's agree that what's really amazing is that you have your point of view and I have my point of view. And we know that. And we can spend all day comparing our points of view. Uh, and that's a phenomenon that we want to explain. Mm -hmm. um, notice, by the way, Let's imagine some Martian scientists or, you know, alien, utterly alien intelligences. They got a lot of good science, though. And they come to our planet. And let's suppose that they, if we can imagine this, and maybe we can't, but let's start with the idea. We can imagine they have no idea of consciousness or quality at all. Martian zombies. Yeah. Martian zombies. They're <laughs> Martian zombies. But they're not just Martian. By being a Martian zombie, philosophical zombies that are Earthlings know all about consciousness yeah, because, they're, yeah. because they have to to get by in the world so, so well. But these are, these are aliens, and they come and they, they study us. Are they going to discover the first person point of view? Of course they are. How? By reading our novels, by hearing how we talk to each other. Um, our, we have filled the world with public, third person accessible representations of our own first person subjectivity. Stream of consciousness novels. And this is all available. This is data, hard data, to the Martian zombies. They can go and hunt through our libraries and watch our television shows and just overhear conversations. And they'll have a very they'll they'll soon learn if they learn you know the rules of baseball and how the stock market works they're also going to learn that we all have a first person point of view i did try unsuccessfully to convince uh, chalmers that the philosophical zombie argument was a great argument for physicalism because if you really believe that the zombie would act exactly as the same collection of atoms yeah, that, that yeah, had yeah. consciousness would, you could ask it what it was experiencing. And it would say, oh, I'm experiencing pain or red or whatever. Mm -hmm. But by hypothesis, it's not. Mm -hmm. So it's lying. 
And therefore, you don't know if you're experiencing those things either because that's exactly what you would do. But he, yeah, he didn't buy that. Well, I don't know. I've tried the same argument on him. <laughs> I, I mean, I think uh, uh, in the end, for, for David and for, say, Galen Strawson, another philosopher, um, they're just so sure that their intuition about their first person point of view is right, that they can't, they can't even hypothetically or for the sake of argument, they can't abandon that intuition. And, you know, I, I appreciate that inability or it's more of a reluctance than an inability. I feel the same way when physicists start asking me to <laughs> set aside some of my intuitions yeah. about space and time and right. so forth. And I, and I say, I hear you. I can't. <laughs> I hear you, but something in me does... I don't know... If, if I try to abandon that intuition, I don't know what to trust. Yeah. Well, it calls up the reliability or the usefulness of introspection generally, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, introspection is where we get a lot of these ideas of our experiences. Should we be generally skeptical of introspection? We learn something from it, certainly. We learn something from it, but yes, we should be, we should be skeptical. Um, first of all, let's start small and build up. Um, I love to point out to my students and others all the ways in which their consciousness isn't the way they think it is. For instance, it seems that our color vision goes right way out to the to the edge of our vision. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It seems that we have high resolution vision out to the side. We don't. I love to point out that, that lots of things that are surprising that I can demonstrate to them. I think, whoa, who knew that? Well, you didn't, did you? <laughs> so forget about the so-called incorrigibility of first person acquaintance. It's that's just that's just a mistake. That doesn't mean that we're not reliable informants to ourselves and others about many features. But forget about this Cartesian idea that on the inside, we are the masters of what's going on. So you're saying that even when we experience the outside world, there's a lot of stitching and jiggery-pokery that comes together to give us this image we have. So... Why shouldn't the same thing be true about our introspection? Well, no, I think that, yes, I, I think that we have very clear cases where people misintrospect, if you like. Um, uh, and, and that raises the possibility, which I think every theorist is really sort of honor-bound to take seriously, that their deepest intuitions, their most cherished intuitions about what their first person experiences might be mistaken. Well, now, you may think, well, I can see where Dennett is going here. <laughs> he's, he's going to the idea that we're all zombies, uh, and, but that we have these strong intuitions that we're not. And in a sense, I think that's right. That in is, a sense. In a sense, that is, um, uh, when we have a proper theory of consciousness, we look around inside, we're not going to find any selves in there. We're not going to find any witnesses in there. So as far as we can tell, when we have that theory, it will be a theory which does not distinguish zombies from conscious beings. Now, is that a failing or... That's the way it should be. I think that's the way it should be. Mm. So, in a sense, the distinction between a zombie, a philosophical zombie, and a conscious being, we've got to abandon that. Mm. And but but then, but then we have plenty of room to distinguish people's being conscious of this or that and being unconscious of this or that, being not just, you know in a coma, but eh, not cognizant of various things that are going on around them, uh, things happening 
beneath their notice, things that are subliminal, things that are unconsciously being done. We can have that wealth of cognitive science and psychology, which has been building up for more than 100 years, uh, is available. And that's all untouched by this. The one thing you have to give up is this idea that you know that you're not a philosophical zombie. No, that's, <laughs> that's just yeah. an artifact of bad theorizing. So just to be super clear, uh, to get the lingo right, you are not claiming that consciousness is an illusion. It's real in the same sense that the patterns that we talked about are real. I mean, we, hmm. our, these yeah. concepts yeah. of experiences play a useful role in how we explain well, what we go through. Well, um, I'm glad you asked that question. Or, yeah, or, or, or no, not. Because, so because, let's um, get it right. Because I like the term illusion. Okay. Um, and I think it's a generational thing. I think that the younger generation has no trouble with illusion as a positive term, as in the user illusion. Hmm. Um, uh, consciousness is a user illusion. In fact, the manifest image is a user illusion. It's nature's way of simplifying the world for us. In the same way that software engineers have brilliantly created these metaphorical icons and sound effects. And think of how badly you would misunderstand a computer if you tried to figure out how computers work by simply extrapolating from the user illusion. Yeah, taking the, literally the files on your desktop. That's yeah. right. The, the, the user illusion is a uh, brilliantly designed, the user illusion of, of, a, of a, a laptop or, a, or a, a smartphone is brilliantly designed to exploit your perceptual and locomotory and hand dexterity powers and, uh, and your audition too, your hearing, to permit you to perform things you want to do ignorant of the details of how it's going on. Same thing is true in your brain. The one difference is that there's no screen hmm. because there's no eyeball in there. So if you want to know who is the... Who is the victim of the user illusion? No. Who's the beneficiary of the user illusion? But now I'm a little confused because we agreed that elements of the manifest image are in often, oftentimes real. Well, yeah, they're real illusions. <laughs> okay, they're real illusions. Well, this I is, mean, they're, they're... Maybe the vocabulary is not that up is, to the that task. Is, um, so consciousness is both real and an illusion. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and, uh, it's a trick. That trick is a better word than illusion. Maybe trick is better a word than illusion? Well, yeah. For years I've been saying consciousness is a bag of tricks. It's a whole lot yeah. of different tricks. It's not one big, galumphing metaphysical trick. It's a whole lot of engineering tricks. And those engineering tricks create an agent that has a instant, reliable dexterous, fluent use of a huge array of representations. The agent, one, doesn't need to know how those representations are created, or, in this case, even where they are or whether they have the properties they seem to have. Um, here's a way of thinking about it. Think of stage magic. I often think I like to use examples from stage magic. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of honor code among magicians. You're supposed to, you're supposed to show something, you know, show, not tell. <laughs> you haven't done a trick if you've simply bribed the audience, <laughs> or or we can we can we can test our intuitions here. What would you think of a magician that used mass hypnosis and uh, simply could hypnotize the whole audience and then, you know, 
have flaming elephants right. dancing on their toes and, and, and no display at all. Nothing on the stage. <laughs> the magician is all alone, but everybody is just going, ooh, and ah. We'd say, well, that's a sort of doesn't cheat. really count, yeah. That doesn't really count. Well, why not? Um, so instead of hypnosis, let's do it scientifically. I mean, hypnosis is a perfectly real phenomenon, but let's, let's say that you've got a magician who says, I now ask people to wear a special headset to my magic shows. And this is a headset which simply beams, I'm going to keep it dead simple, just beams directly to occipital cortex V1, the, the sort of first major wave station for, for all visual information. And it can simply create hallucinations there this is in bypassing the eyeballs. Photons, eyeballs, no longer part, but everything else, you know, from the, say, from, it could be from the optic nerve. Maybe what he's doing is he simply captured the optic nerve with his device. Everything from the optic nerve in is uh, as it would be if there was a flaming elephant standing on its trunk. Uh, would that be magic? Yeah. But, <laughs> but at least we now have people that were darn tootin' sure that they had seen an elephant standing on its trunk on the stage. Um, question. Would they have qualia? <laughs> uh, no. We're throw, we've thrown away the screen. You know, uh, there's no more room. They think they have qualia. They think they've seen the elephant, but they haven't seen the elephant. They, ha they think they've had the experience of seeing the elephant. That's right. Well, uh, they have had the experience of seeing an elephant. It's a bogus experience yeah. because there was no elephant out there. But, I mean, if we take the whole phenomenon from, from the light hitting whatever's on the stage up through the eyes and through to final, to the conviction center, to what people will swear on a Bible they saw. Um, at every point, we could in principle intervene mm -hmm. and lay out the, the food for the consumers at the next layer, level. And it might be very, very light. Mm. <laughs> um, and if it was very, very light, you might get some very anomalous things like, this is weird. I could have, for a moment there, I could have sworn that there was an elephant <laughs> on this stage. I'm, it just sort of hit me. But um, no details or yeah. anything. I mean... We do have experiences like that. Sure. Oh, yeah. So there's a sense in which consciousness is real. There's also a sense in which it's an illusion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and in particular, there's the theorist solution. Okay. What's that? The theorist solution is what the theorist may have and the dog doesn't. The dog doesn't think it has qualia. <laughs> right. The theorist does. That's just... Yeah. That's just false. <laughs> that's just... That's a that's an artifact of bad theory. So would we take the same angle on free will that there's an aspect of it that's real, aspect of which is an illusion? Um. Yes. No. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's a philosopher's favorite answer to everything. Yes. Question. Yes. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, the traditional idea of free will, where somehow our bodies or our brains are are shielded from causation. That's crap. Yeah. That's, it's just got to be false. We're not laws unto ourselves. We're not laws. I mean, we're not, there's no miracles happening like that. So if that's what you think free will has to be, if you think free will is incompatible with, say, determinism, then there's no free will. Yeah. Then free will isn't real. Uh, it's an illusion. But, but, 
But I would prefer to say free will is perfectly real. It's just isn't what you think it is. Yeah. Which you did predict ahead of time that you were going to say. So good. Yeah. So, But it is. So yeah. in the sense in which it's real has something to do with the fact that it plays this explanatory role in the manifest image. It, not just an explanatory role. It plays a huge role in people's lives. Yeah. Um, as I was saying before, um, since our society has the concept of free will, <laughs> when I signed the mortgage papers for this house, I was asked if I was giving my, signing this of my own free will. I <laughs> oh, said, really? yes, yes, I am. Yes. Uh, the notary, Did the agent have any idea notary, who he was talking to? Or no, she the was notary uh, was a, reading this off a piece of paper, and I was only too happy to answer. Um, uh, but some people don't have free will. Some people are incapacitated. Yeah. Some people aren't in control. So there's a very real difference, and it makes a huge difference in life. With, uh, I like to put it this way. Um, consider back to our drone. Suppose we throw away the controller and just let it be its own self-controlled autonomous thing. Pretty dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Well, you think that's dangerous. Think how dangerous we are. Empirically, we're pretty darn dangerous, yes. Empirically, we have, we have millions of degrees of freedom, and we're not in anybody's control but our own. Or we can try to control people. Parents, I like the idea that parents eventually have to launch their children. And once they've launched them, they're no longer guided missiles. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're now autonomous. And how do we dare let people do this? We dare let people do this because we trust that people will have done their best to turn their offspring into self-controlled, responsible, responsible agents. agents. Yeah. And that's what free will is. And there's no metaphysical bright line, but there are lots of legal bright lines and they're negotiable mm -hmm. and invasible. And there's a sort of arms race going on where as we discover one loophole or another, we either exempt or not various people from responsibility or diminish their responsibility. Well, it's the it's the legal, responsible, moral questions that that make this very vivid. And, and absolutely. And I know that you said things. I, I want to take this opportunity to clarify as much as we can. You you've sort of hinted at the idea <clears throat> that even though we sophisticated scientists and philosophers know that there are laws of physics and we all obey them, we should let the people have their free will in some sense because it makes them act more morally. Um, that may or may not be true. For me personally, that fact has nothing to do with why I think that it's sensible to talk about free will. I, I, my, my reason for talking about free will is just the answer you just gave, which is that it does play this role in, in helping you explain what yeah. goes on. Well, I think, I don't think that the idea that we have free will is a sort of holy myth that we should preserve mm. for, you know, for the good of hoi polloi. No, no, no. We all need it. I think it's extremely uh, uh, paternalistic, patronizing to say, well, I don't need <laughs> the illusion of free will, but everyday folks, they need it. No, I think that's, first of all, I think that's just obnoxious. Right. Uh, uh, we all go through life gauging our opportunities, making choices, taking them as seriously as we do, which is sometimes not seriously enough. And sometimes and trying to persuade and others. And sometimes right. too serious. I'm trying to persuade others. Um, it's no secret that this pattern of activity, including mental activity, including Hamlet-like thinking and mulling and musing and worrying, there's no secret why it exists. It's 
It's what makes civilization possible. And I, for one, would rather live in a civilized world. But so that's a very crucial distinction, I think, that has the, the danger of slipping by there. It's not that we need to tell people they have free will to make them civilized. It's that we have to appreciate that we have free will so that we create civilization. Yes, absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's very good. But that, that does mean that the free will skeptics... Uh, including some uh, heavy some of hitting our best friends, scientists, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, some of my best friends. Um, uh, they're really um, they're really engaging in a, a a sort of an antisocial behavior. It's a sort of it's a sort of cognitive vandalism. Uh, I try to shock them with that term. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a little thought experiment about that. The, um, it's possible if you have um, obsessive compulsive disorder to have a little device installed in your in your brain that that will help control it. And, mm -hmm. and so that's fact so far. Now we're going to have a little science fiction. So this chap has obsessive compulsive or disorder, and he goes to his local neurosurgeon and asks for the installation and. She uh, installs it, uh, and then after he wakes up after the operation, she says, uh, and, and now you're free to go. Oh, and uh, by the way, you know, um, we're in, in radio control here. We, we monitor you 24-7, and if you ever uh, are about to commit some terrible act, we intervene, of course. <laughs> uh, have a nice life. I think that's a Black Mirror episode. You have, yeah. have you have watched Black Mirror? No, I know. I think no. that uh, if you if you have any inclination whatsoever, that especially like the first few seasons of Black Mirror are made for you. You should watch all of them because okay. they're all thought experiments about how technology is controlling yeah, yeah, our brain yeah, yeah. and getting into our lives. Okay, so I wonder if Black Mirror has the sequel that I have. So this fellow goes off and uh, reassured that he's got this safety net, he he becomes you know, a little bit slovenly in his decision-making, and he makes some bad decisions pretty soon. He ends up in court, and the judge confronts him and asks him, what about this? He says, well, no, um, I don't have any free will. You know, I'm, I'm controlled. Just obey the laws of physics. <laughs> I, just, I just obey the laws of physics, and, and the, the neurosurgeons, you know, they're, 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 I'm their puppet. <laughs> And uh, the judge calls in the neurosurgeon and says, uh, 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 did, you, did you tell this man that when you put this device in, that henceforth that he would be a sort of electronically controlled puppet? And she said, yeah, yeah, we did. He says, it's not true, is it? He says, no, <laughs> of course not. We're just messing with his brain. <laughs> Now, I, she did something evil. Right. Well, if she, in her white coat, her scientist's white coat, is doing something evil for that guy, what about you folks out there in science land who are going around telling everybody that free will is an illusion, that, they don't, that they're all really just puppets? Why isn't that the same sort of antisocial behavior that this... Uh, neurosurgeon, this imaginary neurosurgeon is engaged in. Hmm. <laughs> I like that. Okay, very good. I will remember that. Not how the Black Mirror episode ended, but still a good one. Um, good. I think to wrap up, um, let's deviate a little bit from, um, you've had a long career with many greatest hits. So I think we've hit, we've hit some of them here. But what are the, there's a worldview that you're sketching out that is very mm -hmm. coherent and, and fits together in, in various ways. Laws of physics, Darwinian evolution, um, intentional stances, real patterns. What are the implications of that? Is we've been we've begun to touch on this, but for morality, for ethics, for how we should live our lives, mm. right? Is there a meta-ethical conclusion that comes from this, or even ethical conclusions? Well, yes, I think there is, um, and part of it is uh, yet another aspect of my work we haven't mentioned is 
It means we don't need religion. Hmm. Religion was maybe a, a good scaffold on which to build civilization. Maybe it, the myths of religion kept people in line and, and cooperating because they were worried about Big Brother watching them. And maybe I'm quite content with uh, hypotheses, not provable, but they might be true, that say that, that civilization depended on religion. I don't think it does that anymore. Uh, I think we, we, we can grow up and simply abandon the myths. Um, but when we do that, we want to be sure that we don't uh, destroy or discard some of the valuable things that came along with that. The, the, the one that, that most concerns me is one that um, you can get at with the, with the line of Robert Frost's. He says, uh, home is where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Now, in that sense, there's a lot of people that are homeless. And don't trust the state to take care of them. One of the things that religions have done over the decades, over the millennia, is taken in and provided a sense of meaning and love for people who otherwise would not have that. And those of us who are fortunate enough to live exciting lives should recognize that uh, this is a social service. To, to call it that is to underplay its significance by orders of magnitude. This is a, a uh, life healing, life protecting life, improving feature of the world that we don't want to throw away. The question is, how do you save it without also saving the sort of brute irrationality or irrationality, the uh, uh, valorization of unreason and superstition uh, I think it's possible to domesticate religions a little further. They've been domesticated a lot, but I think we can go a little farther and keep ceremony, keep community, keep music and art and celebration intact, and leave out the... Uh, uh, myths. Um, but that's a tall order, but I see progress all mm -hmm. around. And I do share the uh, concern that a lot of people have that, that while the, the uh, fastest growing group in the world is the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, those that have no religion at all, if they have no community, if they have no allegiance, if they have no, if there's nothing that they think of that's bigger than and more important than they are to guide their lives, then we're in trouble. It just shouldn't be religion. Yeah. Uh, 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 so I think morality is itself a, is a human, it's a social construct. Uh, and not that, a moral realist. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's really just isn't what you think it is. Yeah. It's not given by God. It isn't uh, uh, deducible from a set of axioms. It's a, in a certain sense, political and rational cre creation of... Ideally, um, an informed community of people. So something can, that we exercise our free will to create. Yeah, we we can imagine as a sort of uh, uh, grounding myth 
Um, there have been philosophers who like to do this sort of thing. Um, uh, you all come, everybody come, you're all welcome. You got to obey some rules, some rules of discourse. And whatever your current beliefs are about what's right and what's wrong, share them with us. If there's something that your group thinks is really, really wrong, and the rest of us haven't seen that yet, that might be eating meat, or it might be, uh, well, any of the things that religions have taboos about. Um, don't just play the faith card and say, well, I'm an exorcist, and exorcists think this is a sin. No, your task is to convince the rest of us that you're right. Give us reasons. Give us reasons. If you can persuade us that there's a case to be made, we'll listen. But if you play the faith card, if you say, this is beyond reason. This is, this is simply who I am. I can do no other. Basically, what you're doing when you say that is you're saying, I'm disqualified from this, this discussion. I'm, I'm disabled. My, my uh, irrationality prevents me from playing the role that's available to me here. And I think if we imagine morality as whatever emerges from that in the ideal circumstance, that's the kind of human construction it is. Well, I think I've done a terrible job at playing the devil's advocate here because I agree with you too much. But uh, <laughs> Dan Dennett, thanks very much for being on the podcast. It was very educational. Well, thank you, Sean. You asked all the right questions. <laughs>